Wow. So welcome, everybody, to the fourth and final President's Dream Colloquium. My name is Dana Leposky, and I'm a professor of archaeology at Simon Fraser University. And I've had just the unbelievable um, pleasure of co-organizing this series on Indigenous people and local communities' perspectives on sustainability and resilience. And I've done that along with my amazing dean, where, where is she? Uh, Naomi Krogman, um, and it's been just amazing to work with you, Naomi. Naomi is the dean of the Faculty of Environment, and I can't imagine a more wonderful dean. So we're gathered here today on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Tulalatu, and the Musqueam nations. And for those many people who are joining us online, I encourage you to take a moment to think about the indigenous people on whose territories you're residing right now. And for all of us, I want us to take a moment to think about what we're doing when we give a land acknowledgement. And what we're doing, it seems to me, is honoring the deep time history and knowledge that comes with being connected to specific places for countless generations. The joint talk tonight by Pan Panapak, Letitia Pokiak, and Lagoud, Spencer Greening, will give us a hint at the significance of such place-based knowledge in a range of realms including battling current issues such as industrial colonization and climate change. I also want to take a moment to thank the David and Cecilia Ting Endowment for teaching, for sponsoring this event. So when I got asked by Naomi to um, help design this, this dream colloquium, I imagine that I wanted to start the series by listening to an elder, and as we did with Qualicum and Kwakwakawak matriarch Kim Okama Kludusi. And I wanted to do that to anchor our discussions in deep traditions. And I knew that I wanted to end the series by hearing from younger community members, as they're the ones who, who are and will be carrying their traditions forward in these changing ecological and social times. Thus, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you Letitia and Spencer. And they're going to share a bit about their work and their journey with us from their, their respective communities. We're going to be hearing first from Letitia and then from Spencer. And there's going to be lots of time, I hope, for discussion with the audience about some of the themes that they raise. So I'm going to take a moment now to introduce Spencer. And then I'm going to turn it over to Natasha Lyons, my friend, who's an archaeologist and ethnobotanist and an impressive knowledge holder herself. And she's going to introduce Letitia. And then Letitia will talk first. So first, a few words to Spencer and about Spencer. In these topsy-turvy times, we've seen many false leaders emerge, people who use their privilege and ability to lie and manipulate to obtain and retain positions of power. True leaders are much harder to come by, however, and thus even more precious. True leaders are people who emerge as leaders because they have immense knowledge, their ability to learn from with, with others, and because of their passionate commitment to help people along a path. Despite Spencer's young years, he is such an emerging leader. This is reflected in his formal positions, such as him being the youngest ever band counselor of his community in Hartley Bay, and his role as a representative for his community at various government-to-government -government negotiating tables concerning the impact of industrial development on his traditional territory. All of Spencer's actions are guided by the advice and knowledge of his traditional leadership, and in fact, he's devoted his life as a Gitgat scholar to documenting to living by this knowledge. Spencer is passionate about being on the land, learning from his ancestral places, and then sharing those teachings to diverse communities. And he does that through scholarly papers, through classroom education, and through storytelling. Spencer is currently combining all these skills in his doctoral studies in the Faculty of Environment at SFU where he's documenting through language, memories, oral tradition, and archaeology the interwoven and rich history of his people in the culturally significant watershed of Lock Alt Sop in Gitgat territory of northern BC. Throughout his research, he never stops asking, how will my work help my community? How can I bring about the most positive change? How can I best represent and share the knowledge I've been entrusted with? Importantly, Spencer's and Letitia's leadership in documenting the ancestral teachings of their people and the right to use that knowledge as a foundation for self-determination ultimately supports and bolsters the connections of indigenous people globally 
to, to support them to manage and, and um, uphold their land and their traditions. There's never been a time in history when leaders such as Spencer and Letitia have been needed more. So we thank you both for being here tonight, for sharing your knowledge and your journeys with us. Thank you, Dana. And it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Panic Pack, Letitia Pokiak. Letitia is an Inuvialik scholar from Tuktoyaktuk, located in the Inuvialuit settlement region in the Canadian Western Arctic. She was raised traditionally in Inuvialuit Nunangat, the homeland of the Inuvialuit people. Letitia comes from a, long, a large and uh, prominent, very well-known family um, that she is going to give more background to. So I will allow her to do that. Her family now and in the past is full of activists, scholars, knowledge holders, and expert land users. A very, very diverse and committed uh, family. Very well known. As an example, her uncle Randall Boogie Pogiak, who she's going to talk about and who recently passed on, was a well-known historian, negotiator, and signatory to the Inuvialuit Final Agreement and later became the president of the Inuvialuit Development Corporation as it developed. Boogie was instrumental to Letitia's own knowledge and the award-winning thesis she ultimately produced at the University of Victoria, which focused on meaningful consultation in the land claims process. Like Spencer, she is committed to the service of her community and carefully chooses how she, um, how she does that and how she makes her decisions around that. She is a proud mother of three children. And with that, I pass you on to Panic Pack, Letitia Pokiak. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Awesome. Nakuyuk Unugyak, Uvanga Panikpak Unuvia Luktara, Tuktu Yak Tuk Mu Tau Yunga, Unuguk Twami, Tuktu Yak Tumi. Good evening, my Unuvia Luk name is Panikpak. I'm from Tuktu Yak Tuk, that is where I grew up. As an Unuvia Luk, I respectfully acknowledge that I am on the lands of the Musqueam, Musqueam Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, whose historical relationship with the, these lands and waters continue to this day. I currently live on the traditional territories of the Comox First Nation on Vancouver Island, whom I have huge respect for. This evening, I'll be sharing with you what sustainability and resiliency means to me as an Inuvia Luk how we have moved forward in a rapidly changing society, including climate change. Before I start, I should mention that what I share and present to you are my own perspectives. So to position myself as an Inuvialuk, the photos on the right are of my great-grandmother, Mamayak, my mom's mom's mom. Her family moved to the Inuvialuk settlement region from Alaska. The photos on the left are of my great-great-grandfather, Bukik, his, who is my mom's dad's grandfather. It is said that he is the peacemaker between the Inuvialuit and the Gwich'in, whose territory borders to the south of Inuvialuit Nunangat. He is also said to be a founder of the town of Aklavik in the Inuvialuit settlement region during a time of encroachment by foreign traders, trappers, and whalers. The picture in the center is of my maternal grandparents, Igalik and Angagak. The photo on the left is another one of my maternal grandmother, Mamayak, great grandmother, the other, and her son, Roy. Mamayak, as I mentioned, is mother to my Nanak, Igalik, and Nanak is um, how we say grandmother in my language. The photo on the right is another one of my great great grandfather, Bukik, our family name of Pokiak, is an anglicized version of his name, Bukik. He actually raised my dadak, angagak, and we say dadak in my language for grandfather. I was raised traditionally in the sense that I was raised by my nanak, Igalik. I grew up spending extended periods of time on the land, camping and subsisting, as our ancestors had done for many generations before us, learning of what it means to be Inuvialuit. 
Though I was raised traditionally, I also attended Grolier Hall in Inuvik during my high school years because my hometown didn't have a high school at the time. It was the so-called end of the residential school era. Grolier Hall closed its doors in 1997. From then on, I eventually went to college and university, including grad school. My family and community have shaped my life in many ways. My traditional upbringing has shaped my connection to and respect for the lands and waters, my respect for knowledge holders, and my appreciation for our traditional practices and traditional foods that sustain us. My lens and worldview stem from my upbringing, subsistence of the lands and waters, living in harmony with the seasons, and migrating wildlife that are, found, that are the foundation for which I draw upon my identity as an Inuvialuk. Both my Dadak and Nanak witnessed and experienced a lot of changes during their time. The picture on the left is of my Dadak around the time that he was a special constable for the RCMP. In the photo on the right, he is preparing to harpoon a beluga whale, or kilalugak as we call them. The kilalugak continues to be a major staple in our Inuvialuit diet. My Dadak Angagak was a traditional man. He was raised traditionally, except for the few years that he attended residential school in her river, through which he learned to read and write. Angagak was one of many field workers for the Committee for Original People's Entitlement, or COPE, which I will talk more on the following slides. He noted that a harvester needs 400 miles in every direction in order to provide for a family. He was an experienced harvester and trapper, he was known for his humble influence and Pitkusimic Ilisamanik, or traditional knowledge. This slide is a close-up of the Tuktuyaktuk region and Husky Lakes, or Imariuk, as we call it. It's a map of place names that my dad have recorded. These place names of many throughout the Inuvialuit settlement region exemplify Inuvialuit life in relation to the landscape. These places are significant for the various cultural activities and history that took place there. Practices on the lands and waters reinforce Inuvialuit culture, knowledge, and sovereignty that has carried us forward over many generations. Inuvialuit culture and knowledge are based on harvesting practices that occur on the lands and waters, traveling on the land to various campsites and place names to harvest resources and practice cultural activities continues to be a way of Inuvialuit life. Not only does Inuvialuit Nanangat and the wildlife sustain us, but we also take care of the lands, waters, and the wildlife. As Inuvialuit, we have our own governance, our own teachings, historians and knowledge holders. We had our own medicine people, prophets and wise ones who provided counsel. You could even say that we had our own researchers and visionaries. Pitkusimik Ilisamanik has ensured Inuvialuit survival in the Arctic. It is shaped by a connection to, to the land where our worldview is formed based on the lived experiences of the people. Inuvialuit Nanangat are spaces filled with meaning and belonging, places where personhood is initiated and carved into being. Inuvialuit have traveled and subsisted on homeland since time immemorial. Sentiments of place and the notion of embodied wellness or holistic well-being speak to the heart of what indigeneity is based upon, which are that identity is tied to places, personhood to culture, wellness to country food, and relationship to lands and animals. So in the late 1960s and 70s, oil and gas reserves were explored for and discovered on Inuvialuit homelands. The federal government tried to, uh, to propose a development. They tried to develop a gas pipeline from the outskirts of my home town of Tuck all the way down to Alberta. Inuvialuit livelihood has, was disrupted. Hunters and trappers united and formed the Committee for Original People's Entitlement, or COPE, to organize themselves against government and industry. Inuvialuit became a formidable force through COPE, which rallied at the grassroots level. During his elderly years, my dad at Angagak was one of many field workers for COPE who assisted in the Regional Land Use and Occupancy Project. 
translating for and interviewing in Velvet regarding their tradi traditional subsistence areas and homelands, giving harvesters voice and acknowledging their way of life. Angagak recognized the political struggle that the Inuvialt would have to undertake to assert sovereignty and authority over homelands. Inuvialt way of life and sovereignty are not only tied to the lands and waters, but they are also tied to the outside forces that our elders rose up against. Prior to contact and encroachment, Inuvialt were the political authority in the Inuvialt settlement region, autonomous with exclusive rights and to certain territories and resources. Inuvialt personhood, pedagogy, spirituality, culture, and well-being derived from the land. In order for Inuvialt to maintain a way of life and sovereignty, an uprising against government and industry was necessary, as the lands hold important social, religious, and legal dimensions. This quote was taken from Northern Frontier, Northern Homeland, the report of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry, Volume 1, by Justice Thomas Berger. Berger was commissioned by the federal government to determine whether the Mackenzie Valley, Valley Pipeline would be feasible, not only for the sustainability of the environment, but also for the socioeconomic and cultural impacts that the people would experience, peoples whose region the pipeline would be intersecting. Berger meaningfully consulted with each indigenous group and community along the proposed pipeline corridor, recording their way of life and the potential impacts the pipeline development would bring. Essentially, he brought moral and ethical dimensions into his work, moral and ethical dimensions that should be at the heart of any form of consultations and policy making. During Berger's inquiry, my dad stated, quote, and a clavic lot of for them days, just like you white people working for wages and you have money in the bank. Well, my bank was here all around with the fur. Whatever kind of food I wanted, if I wanted caribou, I'd go up in the mountains. If I wanted colored fox, I went up in the mountain. In the Delta, I get mink, muskrat, but I never make a big trapper. I just get enough for my own use the coming year. Next year, the animals are going to be there anyway. That's my bank, end quote. Angagak didn't take more than what he needed to ensure that the lands, waters, and wildlife would be protected for future Inuvialuit. The photo on the left is of my dad sharing knowledge during the Berger inquiry. Angagak knew of the political struggle Inuvialuit would need to undertake to intersect the discourse and encroachment of colonial forces. He and other co-field workers consulted with each Inuvialuit household for the sub their subsistence areas and place names. The Inuvialuit final agreement was signed on June the 5th, 1984 in my hometown of Tuck. It took 14 years of consultations and negotiations. A war of words with the government as my uncle Randall called it. Inuvialuit rights and freedoms and our well-being became entrenched in the Canadian Constitution with specified measures and protection of Inuvialuit nationhood. This agreement brought Inuvialuit into terms with the notion of a modern sovereignty. As expressed in my thesis, my uncle Randall stated, quote, the sovereignty is a domestic sovereignty, not between countries. It was within Canada. This is our homeland. I call it a sovereignty within a sovereignty. So we've got protection from Canada, from outside invaders like Russia, United States, and other countries. And we've also got sovereignty within our own nation, end quote. So here's a photo of my uncle Randall, or Boogie as we called him at the far right, while he was a negotiator for COPE. The IFA would be a moment in Inuvialuit and Canadian history that acknowledged the original people, the Inuvialuit, as having formal land rights, political, political and legal agency, and a voice in matters that are at the heart of Inuvialuit well-being. The tenets of the IFA are simple, yet effective, and are open to interpretation. The goals of the IFA are to preserve Inuvialuit cultural identity and values within a nor changing northern society to enable and develop to be equal and meaningful participants in the northern and national economy and society, and to protect 
and preserves Arctic wildlife, environment, and biological productivity. In the following slides, I portray how these tenets are put into practice and how Inuvialuit are carving their way forward as a people, addressing various colonial and climate impacts. This map demonstrates the boundaries of the Inuvialuit settlement region as negotiated between COPE and the federal government. We have six communities and three national parks within the ISR. The three parks are highlighted in green. There are sanctuaries to wildlife populations that India will depend upon and continue to maintain relationship with through coal management boards and harvesting. Wildlife populations and their health depend upon the health of, and conditions of the environment that they migrate through and subsist off of. The Arctic, as I will show you, is heavily impacted by climate change. In terms of sovereignty, I engaged with the term used as my uncle Randall Boogie Pokyak um, had stated. He described it as a sovereignty, he described sovereignty as being in control of our own homelands and its natural resources. He applied it to mean Inuvialuit sovereignty within the sovereign nation of Canada, through which Inuvialuit have the formal protection of Canada. He also referred to it as Canada's commitment to engage with and include Inuvialuit in matters that pertain to Inuvialuit, primarily with regards to land and wildlife management. Essentially, Inuvialuit have given voice to the wildlife, to the land and waters, and affirmed sovereignty by doing so. Randall shared with me what the elders advised and was envisioned by the prophet Isilik, whose memory and wisdom lives on in the elders. As remembered by Randall, Isilik advised, quote, don't let anybody else control you in your own homeland. You're going to have to fight for it. These Kablanak in that war of words won't listen to you as Inuvialuit. Give voice to the wildlife, give voice to the environment, give voice to the ocean, to the land. Become the voice of these that you know so well. Because the wildlife are not only going to sustain you for food, they're going to help you get sovereignty. So in my thesis, I argued that meaningful consultation was a significant factor in the signing of the Inuvial Final Agreement. It was not only the consultation by Justice Thomas Bircher, but consultation that was conducted by COPE as well. The IFA enables us to preserve our Inuvialuit identity and culture and to carve out our own future. Justice Thomas Berger's report of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry is poignant for the manner in which he consulted with indigenous communities along the pipeline corridor, which was rigorous and genuine. His inquiry exemplifies how consultation with indigenous peoples is done in a good way. This enabled him to see how important it was to put a 10-year moratorium on the development of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline which paved the way for Inuvialuit to continue negotiations with the federal government. These are photos that I took one summer during a visit home for a family reunion. These are just a few examples of the country foods that we still depend upon. Oh, I'm missing a slide. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Moving on. Here are a few photos. That's so weird. There should be a picture of ukbiks, as we call them, cloudberries, um, as well as cranberries. Um, no, not, not flipped. So I'm just going to continue. So I'm just gonna read the notes from that slide. So not only do we monitor the wildlife populations, but we are present at any decision-making table when it comes to co-management, policy-making, and potential development. For instance, any industrial development proposals, including one submitted by the Invalid ourselves, go through a rigorous environmental impact screening process and are reviewed by Inuvialuit. Currently, Inuvialuit are exercising food sovereignty in the traditional activities that continue today. 
It was the exercising of land use and food sovereignty that was instrumental in the achievement of the Inibalad Final Agreement. I took these photos during my visit home this past summer. I was fortunate to work on whitefish in the making of Bipsi. Traditional knowledge such as this has been passed down through many generations. That is not to say, though, that food security is a given. There are many families that go without traditional foods due to knowledge loss through the erosion of cultural practices, which are linked to the impacts of colonialism and its rampant exploitation and extraction of resources. What complicates food security further is that healthy foods and the equipment needed to hunt and harvest are costly and challenging for families to provide, or to afford rather. The climate crisis has altered Inuvialt subsistence, occasionally making it challenging, dangerous even, for traditional knowledge transfer to occur from one generation to the next. It's, it's becoming more challenging and dangerous. So as you can imagine, an evaluate way of life and food security are impacted by the climate crisis. This is a photo that I took in the summer of 2019. Over the years, the crashing waves caused the beach and land to erode. Efforts were made to slow the erosion by putting huge boulders along the shore, but that just stalled the, um, stalled the erosion temporarily. A few houses along the west shore of Tuck were moved inland in 2020. Erosion of the lands are happening at alarming rates due to the melting permafrost. The timing of the seasons are altered, both in conditions and in consistency. The animals are affected, thereby affecting the timing and practices of inevitable subsistence. Each of these points highlighted are direct impacts due to climate change that are happening in the Arctic. Impacts include, but are not limited to, coastal land erosion, permafrost melting, rising temperatures, rising waters, unpredictable weather, wildlife are affected, plants, insects, and wildlife are moving further north. Traditional knowledge, as I mentioned, uh, that transfer is now becoming dangerous. There has been a loss of campsites and cabins, and there has been an increase in marine traffic through Arctic waters. Being powerless to the elements, a vital need for adaptation is necessary. Irreversible impacts of the changes are happening to the lands and waters at an accelerated pace. That speaks to the severity of the situation where Inuvialuit government, Inuvialuit government and science cannot keep up with those changes, let alone the research needed to document those changes. This is an aerial view of my hometown of Duktu Yaktuk on the Arctic Ocean, the Nuna Yuwaram Kangani Tagyuk, as we say in our language. As you can see, the whole community is surrounded by Arctic waters. I grew up swimming in the Arctic Ocean when the water was warm enough. Tuk de Yaktuk translates to resembling a caribou, which is based on oral history. This is just one example of many significant place names of cultural landscapes that I grew up with. The houses that I mentioned that had to move inland or along this shore. I don't know if you can see. But to the right there, that, that shore. So cement slabs and boulders, as I mentioned, were placed along that shore to protect the land from erosion. But it hasn't really made much difference. This is another view of Tuck facing the north. In the background is the Nunayuaram. From this angle, you can see how low the ground is and how close the town is to going underwater. Over time, these waters have risen and will continue to rise. Recently, there has been discussions between governments on how to address this situation. Eventually, the whole town will need to be moved inland. The paradox of life in the north currently is that though the Arctic is affected by climate change that is driven by the anthropogenic burning of fossil fuels, northern peoples are dependent upon those same non-renewable fossil fuels. The carbon footprint of the north is a fraction of the carbon footprint of the south. With the Inuvialuit being in the midst and in the front lines of climate change, future making necessitates drawing upon Inuvialuit ontological and phenomenological past as a lens, while drawing upon Inuvialuit political power of the present 
Meaningful consultations and mitigating action are needed for the future of Inuvialuit and Northern peoples in general. So this is a photo that portrays the erosion of coastal lands. This archeological site is just north of my hometown of Tuck at a place now called McKinley Bay. In the three years of archeological work, it washed away. There are many sites along the coast that are at risk or have washed away just like this one. This site was an ancient sod house that was naturally buried over time. So how do we as an Inuvialuit address the impacts of climate crisis? We do so by mobilizing Inuvialuit political powers as set out in the IFA. Inuvialuit leaders have been in the process of negotiating self-governance with the federal government. Essentially, we are putting into practice the second tenet, goal 1B, where Inuvialuit are to be equal and meaningful participants in the northern and national economy and society. In this notion, Inuvialuit leaders and Inuvialuit in general are able to mobilize Inuvialuit participation in any future making efforts. As sovereign people, we are, we are at the decision making table in matters that pertain to the Inuvialuit settlement region. For instance, we just recently, IRC passed a child welfare legislation in which we could be in control of matters pertaining to our children who may be impacted by social problems that are, are a direct result of the colonial systems. IRC also recently passed a le heritage legislation through which we have control of our own heritage sites uh, for them to be mitigated against in terms of research and development. Recently, IRC has developed a climate change strategy which lays out areas of food and wellness, safety, housing and infrastructure, education and wellness, ecosystem and diversity, and energy as the focus of Inuvialuit-led climate action. Climate change programs and policies are aimed to, aim to be driven by both Pitkusimic, Ilisaminic, and Western science. Inuvialuit leadership aims to consult with, with knowledge holders, including various Inuvialuit departments to inform climate change policies and initiatives and to lead the implementation and monitoring processes. We also have the means and authority to address impacts of climate change through meeting and partnering with other Inuit organizations to combine efforts to learn from and to collaborate on various initiatives. IRC has collaborated with, Inuvi with the Inuvialuit Tapir, Inuit Tapir Kanadami on a national Inuit climate change strategy, and they've also collaborated with both ITK and the federal government on an Arctic and Northern policy framework for Inuit Nunungat. Collaborating with other governments and organizations are important to addressing the climate crisis. In closing, as caretakers of Inuvial Nunungat, we entangle political and ethical discourses where Inuvialuit rights, polities, and existence are connected to the ecological health of the lands and waters. So lastly, I would just like to end with saying how grateful I am for the accomplishment of the COPE field workers, negotiators, and signatories who are pictured here. Not all the COPE members are captured as there's just too many to give credit to. There's actually it was on record 117 COPE field workers or negotiators. I should also thank the Simon Fraser University and the stewards of these lands, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh for allowing me to present here today. Queen Nani, thank you. Thank you so much, Leticia. Now we'll turn it over to you, Spence. okay? Yep. Nice. Thanks, Leticia. Thanks, Dana and Natasha for the introduction. I'll get right into it. Um, I'll, I'll start with this house front here. This is uh, Tsum Sien house front and I wanted to start it, start with this 
image because there's this theme throughout what I'm about to talk to you all about today that's represented in this story. In this story, there are these Tsimtsian people that get sucked into this whirlpool and brought underwater, and these beings represented here uh, start to teach them lessons. They teach them laws. They teach them governance. They teach, teach them about institutions. And so it's this non-human world that's really showing these humans how to live. And, and this is something I like to think about, and again, this is the theme that I kind of will reference throughout the talk today is there's something special about existing in ecosystems for such a long time that they start to reveal how you should live in that place. These ecosystems sort of lay out a rule book of how to be there, how to live there. And if you, you listen closely enough, those species will do the same. This is just a bit of representation of that. Uh, but before I get too carried away, I'll, I'll introduce my people. Uh, I come from the Gitkata people, the Gitkat First Nation of the Tsimtsian, the Tsimtsian people on the northwest coast. And uh, we, you can see us here on the map, uh, kind of near southeast Alaska. If you took Haida Gwaii and flipped it onto the mainland, that's kind of like Tsimtsian territory, a similar shape. But this ecosystem you see is really what makes up our worldview. This influences how we, how we see, how, how we connect the dots as humans. It's made up from this landscape, these ecosystems, and, and how they show up in our culture. And our people really believe that, myself included, I'm not saying I'm separate, we really believe that um, we live with that ecosystem. We're, we're a part of that ecosystem. Some of you may know, some of you may not know, but there's a very, I've never come across an indigenous culture where this idea of wilderness exists, wildlife exists. It's, it's just like you're a part of this system. And, and that, we, in my mind, we embody that. And when you talk to elders, when you listen to them speak, they always speak to the non-human world as if they are humans. They're so-and-so people. They're the fish people. They're the wolf people. And they're their own society. And that's why it's, that first image is grounded in this idea that these other beings have agency and they can give us these lessons of how to organize, how to structure. And, and the same thing is said, it's the wolf society people that did this. It's, it's the wind people that did this. So just think of that, that's in, our, in how we understand the world. This other picture here, I want to talk about governance and how we, as humans, how do we control ourselves and, 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 and organize on our landscape. So as most of you probably know, uh, with indigenous people in Canada, there's the Indian Act Band Council system, and then there's traditional systems. And on the northwest coast, you might often hear hereditary systems. And those would be the systems of governance that were in place prior to the Indian Act system. In my territory, you can see the village there. It's quite remote. Uh, it's only accessible by seaplane or, or boat. Uh, but the watersheds surrounding it represent our traditional territories. And within those territories, you can imagine rivers, islands, watersheds, sort of, if you carved it up, different clans, different lineages, house groups, as we call it, would steward those different places. They have rights and title to those places. And then the Gitkata people come together and make governance de uh, decisions based on that. And one of the few ways it reflects the colonial system is you can imagine how our country is carved up and members of parliament represent. It's one of the few ways that it represents. <laughs> uh, 
we're also lucky that with our systems for our people in the Gitgat First Nation, um, there's been this combination of band council and hereditary. We, uh, our, our, our elected leadership council has actually handed over power to our hereditary system so that any land-based decisions, they have veto. And, and it, it, it's great for us because that handing over of power shows where our, our priorities are in this case. And for the government, when we're dealing with them, it's quite frustrating because they only want to deal with band council. And so it, it, it anchors us in, in the decisions we make in the governmental world. Uh, and, and you see a lot of conflict when those two governance systems are separate, as, as you might see. Um, probably the, the biggest sort of conflict that we've seen lately is the Unistotin, and, and that's a, a hereditary group that's fighting for its rights in a specific area while it's facing off with other band councils, other places. Uh, I just wanted to highlight some of the foods. I wanted to put a picture where I look real tough <laughs> with my Rambo knife and bloody hands. I also didn't look, include many plants, which I don't know, maybe subconsciously they weren't, didn't look tough enough, but in reality, they are some of the toughest things. I don't know what's going through my head. <laughs> but that's what came out. Anyways, you can see, like, these are some of the beings that show up, that sustain us, but also some of the beings that we build relationship with and, and are in that, in that, I like to talk about it as a marriage. We're in this marriage with each of these species and each of the, the ways we engage with them is different. And it, it, it's, it's in this intimate relationship of knowing that place that we see how each of these things taught us how to harvest it because we listened. And so, again, that theme will show up. So I, I think I was asked to, like, tell where you fit in. Um, here's, here's me with some wonderful people from my community. I, I sort of started this journey. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a learner. I, 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 I just see myself as a learner, and uh, that's the role I'm holding right now. But as you become a learner, things sort of attach themselves, roles attach themselves to you. And so uh, I owe so much to my mentors, my elders, that have hosted me as this learner. And through that process, I ended up doing research. And as you know, I'm here finishing out my PhD. But a lot of my research was community-based, culturally relevant, uh, within the community. And as those roles came on, I got more involved in the hereditary system. And this is actually at one of our feasts or potlatches where um, I've been given the role of master of ceremonies or MC, and I do my best to hold it down. I don't know if I held it down here. It looks like they're all laughing at me. <laughs> but, um, and then in time, I also... Uh, became a representative on uh, elected leadership council, the band council system, as Dana mentioned, which I'm not anymore, but I, I did get some time there. So that's some context. But where that's, I think that's relevant is, it, I think with any indigenous leaders the, or, or people who engage in the political world engage in decolonization, they really have to straddle multiple worlds. I think maybe that's why Dana asked me to put this in here, is to highlight that as Indigenous people, not just Letitia and myself, but anyone in these roles, we're straddling these different worlds. And we straddle these worlds when we try to When we try to address the challenges that we have faced or we don't want the future generations to face. And so I'm going to highlight 
some of those challenges. <laughs> if I was highlighting all of them, it would be a much longer list. It's just a few. So this next slide, I'm talking about industrialization. I chose this background picture on purpose. I don't know if anyone follows art history. Um, it's, uh, it's John Martin's depiction of hell uh, entitled Pandemonium. And for, uh, I just wanted to be funny because whenever I get engaged in governments or with government or uh, corporations, they have this ridiculous greenwashing, like in their pamphlets, they'll show like bountiful forests, and as you can see from Letitia's presentation, like all this stuff that's adding to climate change, it's not creating beautiful lush forests, it's kind of creating this hellscape, maybe, I don't know, I might be dramatic, but like, let's be realistic, in 50 years, is that what um, California's going to look like, I don't know. So there's another part of this, too. Um, I, I mean, it shows my bias of what I think of industrial development and what it's like to deal with these folks. And finally, I think there's something about this, this painting comes from the Victorian era. And I think there's something about Victorian monotheism that like should take some responsibility about this, like how we extract resources today, how we conceptualize what we take from the land as a larger society. But anyways, I digress. I just wanted to get the crowd laughing a bit. For those watching online, they don't know we have a crowd of like 10,000 people. And all 10,000 enjoy my jokes. So let's start off with the pipelines and tankers. When I was on council, like I came in and we were just totally deep into this court case with the Northern Gateway project, Enbridge Northern Gateway pipeline, and the associated oil tankers that would come with it. And uh, our council and elders and community had been dealing with this for like a decade prior to me getting involved, and it was just exhausting. And uh, I mean, you, you're already aware of what damage this can do and what damage these industrial projects are doing. But I, I wanted to point out, what's it like on the ground? And so for a small nation, we had sunk all our money into fighting this in the courts. Everything we had. And on the side of our desk was still 12 proposed other projects. LNG pipelines, tankers, other bitumen facilities, refineries. And so just to give an idea of what this, it's like death by a thousand cuts when you're engaged politically. And you can't really, you have to really choose your battles. And this is where the system is failing in a sense. The system is failing in just having any sort of human empathy and treating these things as one and done contracts that can just happen and just turn over at a desk. And, and the other part of this, if you see nations accepting these projects, they're not actually accepting it. They never asked for it most of the time. Very few actually want to do it. But on the ground, when you're in those negotiation rooms, the only chance you get to have a say, unless you actually want to sue them and take them to court, which costs millions of dollars you don't have, you just get involved and you try to mitigate what's going to happen. And, and the government and the proponent or the corporation will kind of hear you out and say, oh, yeah, we'll try to incorporate your concerns. And, you know, here's a bit of money for your troubles if they do that. And so that's kind of the system failing. I mean, forestry, we have the same issue. Here in BC, everyone should have heard about the old growth logging issues we're facing. Here I have a picture of, again, when I was on council, the same time we were in the courts with Enbridge, we were in the courts with a logging company. Here, they had this cut block, and they left all these trees. They didn't, didn't even take them. And the reason being was because the market dipped, and it wasn't worth their time or money to just take them. 
They also happened to leave a ton of trees that only halfway made it down the block over salmon stream, a salmon bearing stream. So it was just like icing on the cake of <laughs> my saltiness towards them. But it, it, here's the breakdown, the frustrating part in this industrial complex that gets disguised as reconciliation is, is we're coming to this issue in two totally different ways. The, the way the system is set up, a win for completing that project, a win would be how much can we, profit can we get while pushing the threshold of the ecosystem as far as we can without getting in serious trouble. And the frustrating part is it's the environmental assessment process of Canada that decides what the threshold is. And as they decide, and, and, and our conception of what is healthy, a healthy ecosystem system degrades, that threshold gets more and more dangerous. So again, I'll go back to that. The, the win for that team, let's say, is how much profit can we make without going past that threshold. A win for us as Indigenous people. And this clicked when you're talking about Ngagak, is that your... Un yeah, he, he was talking about like this, this bank system, a fundamental difference in what, why you would want a bank system. And in this system, we're like, accumulation is the answer. In this system, it's like, we just want to continue to live here. And we want to live here in a sustainable way so we can continue to live here indefinitely. That's a win for us. And so if you can imagine this, I use this analogy often. It's like two teams coming to play a game. Let's say it's basketball. One team shows up, and they say, the way we win this game is we score the most points. And the other team showing up and say, well, the way we win this game is whoever passes it back and forth the most gets the most points and wins. And, and that creates utter chaos because the rules are different. These are like moral rules where they butt heads. And we're just not playing the same game. But it's this disguise of reconciliation that, that really skews these processes and, and um, impact benefits ag agreements. And, but we're still in the same, we're in a different place of what it means to come together, to build relationship, and what it means to work in this place. And, and if the system just took that, that top priority of profit and moved it down like one bar to the second priority, so much would change, but it hasn't happened. And it's not happening. I, I use the word relationship, and, and that's what this is all about. Maybe I'll get to that after. Um, the next one's industrial fishing, and this is a tough one for us to talk about, because so many of our people are commercial fishermen. And so, we're working with elders and community members who have fished their entire lives in this industry, know so many amazing traditional teachings, but are also watching the collapse of an entire, let's say, uh, species of salmon. And uh, I've been uh, privileged to uh, produ help produce a paper with some wonderful colleagues, Andrea Reed, which is right here, um, discussing traditional methods of fishing and, uh, and how it, it offers this sort of alternative. It gives hope to this alternative. And, and the way I've interpreted this process of looking at traditional fishing, traditional management methods of fishing salmon, what I come out with at the end is that our, our traditional methods of fishing salmon through in the river, through weirs, through fish traps, all those ways, actually they can actually compete with commercial levels of fish harvest. So it's not how much you take sometimes, but it's how you take it. It's the method. And try to, to try to summarize this, a commercial boat will go in and scoop up an indiscriminately a bunch of salmon. Let's say in a traditional method where you're using fish traps, fish weirs, you can include traditional ecological knowledge, indigenous knowledge around selective harvest. So you could actively, 
let's say, manage two different streams where you're allowing super spawners to go up. You're, you're actively, as humans, allowing this system to thrive while harvest, where you manipulate the salmon genetics, where you manipulate the, the encompassing forest because of the salmon, but you're also taking large amounts, but you're doing it selectively. One of these boats might just take up an entire one river and not have any selective fishing. And that's where the danger is, because we're not on the ground listening to the place. But again, I want to go back to relationship. I, I like to take a human approach to these issues, because at the end of the day, it's humans dealing with humans when we're in these government rooms and dealing with industry. And often, again, it, it gets treated like it's a non-human thing, this contract. I, I came across this quote from Gabor Mate, who he got the quote from Krishna Murti. And it was, without understanding relationship, any plan of action will breed conflict. I'll say that one more time. Without understanding relationship, any plan of action will breed conflict. And the way I've interpreted that is that if you don't have relationship as the foundation, like a dedication to relationship, all these human faults can show up because your priority isn't that, how do we live here together in the long term? Your priority is somewhere else. And where your priorities are somewhere else, they often become more selfish. And then you're, you're vulnerable to individualism. You're vulnerable to, to power, control, all these things that we see in colonialism. And so that stood out to me, and it's just like a basic understanding. And it kind of hit the nail on the head of when I sit down in a traditional meeting that could be very tense, very controversial with our neighbors, the difference is that end game of what's a win here. And it's that so both of us, whether it's the Haida, whether it's the Heltzuk, whether it's the Tsimsian neighbor, so both of us can continue living here indefinitely. That's like this grounding in relationship, this anchor that we just don't see in any of these rooms. So, I mean, there's some food for thought, I think. <laughs> uh, but let's go to, like, I wish I had better answers. I'm just, like, pointing out faults. And, um, and I'm about to do some more of that. Let's talk about climate change. <laughs> um, this is another existential sort of thing that we're not really sure how to deal with it. Letitia showed some stunning imagery of the erosion, and I mean, I think we all know it's the effects of climate change and how, you know, industrial development adds more CO2 to the atmosphere, the warming of the, the, the earth, the waters, killing biodiversity, all these things. This is a really freaky picture um, that I stole from CBC, but it's a picture of uh, salmon in Heltzuk territory where there's just a ton of unspawned salmon. We've seen that in, um, in our home territory too, where it's just what usually happens, what I think happens in other people I've talked to is as we get drought, there's this combining effect of uh, the rivers get shallower and then the waters get warmer and then the fish just wait there. They need a specific temperature to spawn and they never get it. And so they just die with all their eggs and, and never having spawned. And we're seeing stuff like that. And it's from the alpine to the ocean, we're seeing this change. And it's hard because it's this tangible, intangible thing where we don't know what the future holds. And so I have a maybe a half solution or a, some insight that I hope maybe will lift your hearts a bit. Um, so we have oral histories that speak to climate change, that speak to ecological disaster. And the beautiful thing about that is that we came out of it. Now, I'm not saying, oh, don't worry about climate change. <laughs> but I'm saying there's something we can 
analyze and learn from here. And, and this is where some of my work comes in, is, is looking at these oral histories and the indigenous laws of these challenges, these ecological, environmental challenges. So some of these stories, these stories of indigenous law speak to this deep time resilience, so thousands and thousands of years. What we perceive as normal when it comes to sea level change, when it comes to these ecosystems might have only been 2,000 years on the coast that they look like that, which is a portion of, let's say, Archaeologically, we've shown at least 14 to 16,000 on this northwest coast, and our people would say a lot older, which I believe. So that's a blip in time where this is normal, um, the ecosystem we see today. But again, I'm not saying, like, let's just <laughs> ride this wave of climate change. Um, there was this moral spiritual, moral, and value shift in any time ecological disaster happened. And so this is what I hope like some of this research brings up, is these stories of how human societies need to go an, a dramatic paradigm shift in these times, or else they totally get wiped out. That's what the oral histories say. So you can't just ride the wave and do nothing. Then you get wiped out. You, yeah. There has to be a shift of some sort. And it goes back to that theme. That shift involves listening to the landscape. Getting this intimate connection with the ecosystems. Luckily, indigenous cultures have a long history of listening to ecosystems, being a part of them. And having our every culture, any old culture with the ancestral knowledge has a glimpse of what that looks like. So I'm going to try to really paint a picture so it's more digestible. Of like, who reveals these stories, Spencer? Tell us one of these stories. Uh, so I don't look flaky and like I'm lying. I will tell a story. My favorite one that I've been doing research on is about mountain goats. And uh, we have this story on... Um, it's kind of shared between the Tsimsian, the Niska, and, uh, and the Gixen. But it's the story of a downfall of civilization caused by the mountain goats. And it was that mis human misbehavior was running rampant, and the goats had enough. And so they, they, they just destroyed us. And, um, and there was only a few survivors. And uh, after that event... They, they kind of came up to us and they said, you know, this is a relationship here. This isn't a one-way street. And uh, we recognize that you need us. And we accept that. There's this beautiful thing in nature where there's reciprocal relationships amongst beings sometimes. Like, I, I th out east, there's like the beans, the corn, and the squash. Did I got that right? Nice. Oh, not too long ago, I got obsessed about watching this video of kangaroos going to a watering hole. And they had huge ticks. And, and like the crows and the ravens would hang out at the watering hole and nail those ticks right off their face. And it was raunchy. <laughs> but it was also so cool to watch because it's like so much life and death happening in one place. It's just like symbiosis. The Mati knew what's up, and they're trying to tell us this. They're like, hey, go watch that video on YouTube. <laughs> no. The Mati were like, actually, we have stories of a lot of species saying this, saying humans are the most vulnerable. So we understand that we need to give a portion of our lives to them. And, and, but this is how you do it. It's not like this sort of free thing. You need to honor us. And, and, and we honor them through many different ways. It can be song, often it's ritual. I'm an avid hunter, and so I think about this a lot. I'm obsessed about mountain goats, and it's like 
I love thinking about hunting mountain goats. But there's so much involved in that, where there's ritual cleansing, there's ritual f- fasting, there's ritual medicine work, there's protocols that they gave us. And this is one relationship. This is one species that laid out that rule book. I, again, I take this human approach because, well, I'm a human, so at least I present as a human. Who knows? <laughs> um, if we take a human approach and imagine this as a marriage, then I think it becomes more digestible. And, and, and so something that we have wrong here, I think, I'm going to beg on Western science for a bit. And it's not that I, I don't see value in Western science, but there's something about Western science where we just want to accumulate so much data. It's like our brains need to be an archive. But that's not what the Mati wanted. The Mati didn't want us to understand them down to every molecule. The Mati just wanted us to be good partners. So when we come to like analyzing these ecosystems, we need to get our shit together and just become good partners. Like that's what it's about. And so again, we do that through ritual. We do that through communication. We do that through these ancestral ways. It's not my job to convert you all to have the same spirituality as me, but it's like, trying to flip the script here. The maintenance of this relationship looks like leaning into the land more, listening to these things, creating that intimate connection. And again, this is one species. This is kind of like a framework for every species in our ecosystem of which we are, we are a part of. So where do we go from here? Well, when it comes to industrialization and relationships to the government, indigenous law and rights and title cases and these, that arena, we've, there's been leaps and bounds. Like the, the world of my, that my grandfather grew up in, my world is so different. And indigenous people have more power than they've ever had, which is beautiful to think about. There's a lot of work to be done, but it's beautiful to think of that. And I, I like imagining how my grandpa would conceptualize that and, and the hope he would have, seeing that his resilience and his, our families, like we made it out. So how are we going to make it out of these next steps? It's just something that came to mind. Um, but that's in the legal world. So like, that's a fight we need to keep fighting. And we keep working on, and ho- hopefully it'll move forward. BC just got a wonderful new indigenous uh, woman, a Cree woman, Margot Greenwood as a senator a couple weeks ago. That's exciting. So that's an example. I mean, that just popped into my head. So we keep this momentum by doing that work we do, research, legal work, pushing boundaries as indigenous people where we have this power to challenge, especially in BC, to fight in the courts. But just as important is the social change. Like I think we get, sometimes we get too obsessed about this legal aspect, this governmental aspect. But it's like, what do we do in our day-to-day life? And how can we address that paradigm on how we view the world? And I think the social change in everybody's brain that has so much more power than just the legality of what's on paper. So it's about this paradigm shift. And, And my hope is that, you know, sharing these stories, um, sharing these ideas, like this is how we create that social change. It's questioning, you know, where do your laws come from? Where do your ideas of how to live with an ecosystem come from. And, and knowing that we all have the potential to tap into these ecosystems that we're residing on. So that brings me to my final point is, 
um, I hope at the least, like there's this very tangible thing we can do. Most of us here are engaged in academia. Some of us not, but our own research we can influence. Um, you know, any legal research, we, we can do consulting, we can do these things, but there's this very tangible thing we can do in our everyday lives. That's on the individual level we can get to know the ecosystem we live in more. And I think that's the start of this paradigm shift. If you lean into the land and almost become more vulnerable to that land and rely on it more, you get this beautiful insight. You start to care about, it's not that you care more, but you care in a clearer way. I was having breakfast with Dana this morning and uh, something dawned on me. She, we were eating her apples from her apple tree and she said, they're not very good apples. The pollinators didn't have a good year. And uh, I've heard, like, pollinators are doing bad. They're dying. Cell phones, cell towers, all this stuff. But I had never actually had tangible, something tangible that I could feel and understand. Oh, yeah, that's because of the pollinators that I knew of. Dana, a non-Indigenous person living down here, has this garden where she has this tangible emotional tie to that ecosystem. And that's just apples. Like, there's so many other vegetables that Dana grows that create that emotional tie that will get Dana fired up about this is why the ecosystem is connected, how it's revealing itself to me, and why I should care about it. And so that's just like, I don't know, go home and start a garden if you don't have one. That's a really easy place to start. I don't expect you to all come to Hartley Bay. And <laughs> We're lucky that we have that territory to do that. I should mention that, that it's a privilege. And as Letitia mentioned, there's colonization has removed people from territories. But we can always start somewhere. And we can always start listening to the land again. And hopefully this grows on a communal level. Like once individuals do that, you get communal support. You get communal empathy. People care about these same issues. And then that social change might grow to, the paradigms might change to a grander societal scale on that global and national scale, which I think is happening. I'm just here reiterating things on some level. Um, to end, I just... I had this like final thought, and it's that I've been doing some reading for one of my papers, and it's uh, Julie Cruikshank, the anthropologist. She speaks of oral histories and how indigenous people in the north, Alaska, Yukon, talk about glaciers having agency. Glaciers swallowing communities, being sentient beings, that if you do the wrong thing, they can punish. They can, but they can also bring beautiful things. In my home community, we have stories of sea level change, massive floods, destruction. But at the end of the day, these stories also highlight that resilience. That this happened however many thousands of years ago. But these are the changes we made to get to where we are today. And this is what created our resilience. So again, I don't think it's my job to convert you to believe all these things are sentient, to believe my spirituality, but it is my job to share these stories because that's what the ancestors did. That's what they've done for thousands of years. So with that, I'll say thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Spencer. Um, amazing. So I would like to actually to take a moment to ask the audience if you have any questions of, to ask of the Letitia and Spencer about the life and times in their home, home territories, their views of the world, whatever. It's all up for grabs. And I will pass the mic to you if you'd like to ask a question. We have one right here. 
Hi. Oh. Uh, this one, yeah, this one's for Leticia. Um, I, um, seeing so much conflict um, in, um, in uh, intergovernmental relations between Indigenous people and Canada, um, I'm wondering what your thought is about um, why the COPE movement was so successful. What are the factors that contributed to um, that maybe, I know you mentioned also the actually just um, uh, consultation process, but if there are any other factors within COPE itself or within that negotiation process, I'd love to know about that. Thank you for your question. Um, I would have to say that it was a different time, I think. Um, the politics, I think, were a bit different. Uh, it's a very remote area where I think our people were still unified. It was easy enough for them to um, to to know like what their values were and what they wanted to preserve. And so they really rallied at the grassroots level. Um, it was a movement that the people themselves wanted to, to be a part of. Um, and, and they were really a unified front and really came together and, and wanted to preserve their livelihood, their ways of life. Um, and I think with the colonial impacts, there's been so much degradation of our values and um, disunity and, um, it, it, yeah, it was just a different time, different politics, different um, movement, um, but for the most part, they just really wanted to, to ensure that um, our livelihood, our culture, our way of life was there, was going to be there for future generations. Thanks for your question. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. And my question is, can you hear me? Yeah. My question is about the impact of you know the recent flood in and flood and uh, fire. So it has affected both the animals as well as the trees, and also this whole onslaught of uh, deforestation and grabbing the land is having an impact on. The, and how is the resistance? Uh, that's my question. But I also wanted to comment about the goat. I like the story of goats because in East Africa, we had a program for every child born plant one fruit tree, for every grandchild born plant two fruit trees as part of fruit security. And then the goats came. And so we had to balance and give two trees to the goats. Thank you. <laughs> I guess I could just speak to the floods and the drought and I mean all, all I can really say is that they're real and so one of the frustrating parts of this is when you live with the ecosystem um, and you, you try to be a, as a part of as much a part of it as you can you see how like that picture of the fish that didn't spawn because of drought it's not just you that suffers. It's not just the fish that suffers. It's so many other things in the system that suffers. Um, an, an example that, again, some of you may know or may have heard is that uh, you can look to trees to see how good of a fish year it was at a certain point based on the growth rings in the tree and the nutrients that go into these ecosystems. And so you imagine that just how one flood or one drought, both of them can have such a, a wild effect on salmon. You're not just removing that one species, but you're removing nutrients from an entire ecosystem, 
from, from the plants to, you know, the, the bears, the deer, the moose, to, and, and the ones who, you know, fly, the ones in the air, and the ones in the trees. And, and so it's a little overwhelming. Um, I, uh, I don't really know what else to say other than it's present. And uh, I know in our territory at one point in the last couple of years, there was one fall where we had this record number of, I don't know if it was, it was in the teens of how many slides, mountain slides we had in one month in our territory. And so if that becomes a regular thing, it's, yeah, we're, we're going to have to be really gentle, but also have this heightened awareness of where to go and where, how to harvest and how to live in that, in those places. This was a, this was a question for Leticia and I believe it was on when you were talking about erosion um, one of the bullet points that you had listed was the transfer of knowledge is becoming dangerous, and I was just wondering if you could ex like just speak to that more and like how that's becoming dangerous. Thank you for your question. Um, in the presentation, I also noted that the weather is unpredictable. Um, the, the spring thaw is happening much quicker than it was like, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. The fall freeze up is happening later than, than it has in the past. The ice has become very unstable and um, the knowledge holders can't keep up with those changes. And so, um, just as an example, when hunters and harvesters are traveling and, and on the land and, and on the waters, uh, the, the ice, um, there, it has become dangerous in the sense that um, harvesters have actually fallen through the ice. Um, it, it just makes it that much more precarious for, for harvesters and hunters. In the fall, it was a number of years ago now where um, some harvesters had went out um, in their boats to, to go and harvest caribou along the coast. And with the unpredictable weather, they never came back home. So it's like, that's just one instance. In my interviews for my thesis, there, it has been mentioned that, um, and these are experienced hunters, these are like elders, knowledge holders, like as they're traveling on the land with, with their skidoos in the springtime, going out to their, their campsites, have fallen through the ice and have been quite lucky with, um, you know, somebody in, within the vicinity able to like pull them out. So it's, it's like the, the ice has become unstable. Um, the weather very unpredictable. Um, I mean, those are just a few examples. But thanks for your question. Thank you both so much. I, I mean, that was just a beautiful set of stories and I'm really grateful to you both for sharing in all the ways that you did and you do your communities like immensely proud in, in sharing in these ways. And I, I just wanted to say I appreciated the mention and um, attention to Thomas Berger, who's also super dear to, to me and to my nation. He was legal counsel for the NISCA for many, many years, um, was the, the lead counsel on the Calder case and uh, has played a critical role in our history. Um, I also wanted to, to make the comment that w I feel like cumulative effects is this topic that's getting so much attention these days and people are struggling with how to make cumulative effects frameworks account for all these dimensions that you both spoke to. And that one slide where you shared just that, that really impactful list that included TK transfer becoming dangerous. I feel like you've, you've done so much good in that in terms of how we can bring in these social, really important dimensions 
into this, and people are struggling with how to conceptualize that, and I feel like you did it like in a nutshell. Um, so I, I had one more comment that I'm wanting Spencer's comments on, and that's that my, a colleague of mine, Ken Paul, who's Wallace Duck, has been talking a lot about the four directions really guiding his own, his own thinking um, and how a life in balance, you know, keeps these four directions in check with one another, but we can look at the four directions as a cycle and as uh, a life, and a life means that there's also death. And he, I was just thinking about your, your metaphor of, of marriage and, you know, kind of like the death do us part kind of thing was ringing in my ears, and I was just thinking about, I don't know, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on death being part of natural cycles and, and maybe part of the solution when we look at these really harmful things that exist is, is you know, like the death of a company, not just perpetual growth. Is that something that resonates with you, Spencer? No, now there. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. Those that don't know, Natasha now knows. In a past life, I played in a death metal band. <laughs> and so this is like 20 year old Spencer gets really excited at this. <laughs> this, <laughs> this imagery and this theme. Um, I, I'm, I'm not here to praise death. Um, but I will say, Western culture has a funny relationship with death. And that's something to look at. I, I think of cultures, of which ours are included, uh, ones that believe in reincarnation, that believe in uh, uh, the interconnection between human and non-human worlds in a spiritual way. I think understanding and being open to those ideas becomes much easier. And that open mind brings I, 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 this flexibility, flexibility of navigating. And, and, and it's interesting that what this might be is a death of a culture, a death of the Western culture. And I feel like most people in the West would be very uncomfortable with that. Um, I'm just shooting from the hip. And I, <laughs> but those are some thoughts that come to mind, especially when it comes to you know, the taking of life as a hunter, as a harvester. There's just such a different relationship around that. And uh, um, I think there's this openness to vulnerability. That's a word I used while talking. And uh, vulnerability to the ecosystem, vulnerability to what the earth has in store for us. I, before I dig myself too deep into a and into these ideas that start to make no sense, I'll stop there. I don't know if you want to add to it, Letitia. I mean, maybe I could elaborate. Can you guys hear me okay? I guess, like, in a sense, death is kind of, in a sense, important in, in my own culture. Um, it, through like rites of passage, you know, a young hunter at the age of nine, seven, whatever, um, you know, going out to hunt a caribou, um, you give thanks to, to that caribou. And the first hunt, his first cap capture or catch is actually given to the elders. It's a death. I mean, there's, it's, it's a cycle, right? It's a life cycle. Um, and I think what's important in, in that teaching is that you don't overhunt, right? You always make sure that there's going to be enough for future generations. You have to ensure that um, the, whatever species it is that you're, you're harvesting 
um, just making sure that you're not over hunting, you're, you're hunting at certain times of the seasons, whatever, to, um, that's going to make sure like you're not hunting during, you know, like calving or you're, you're hunting like males as opposed to females, right? To, to make sure that like the, the females are going to be able to reproduce. And so, um, yeah, like I, I can't emphasize enough like how much, like as Spencer was saying, like as indigenous people, we live in reciprocity with the various um, species that we are in relationship with. So as I mentioned, like not only do, does the wildlife sustain us, but we also protect them and make sure, making sure like that, that their environment is sustainable, that um, we are not over hunting, that they're also healthy so that we can be healthy, if that makes sense. Thank you so much for your presentation and sharing your knowledge and your life and your experience with us. My question is actually not related to the presentation, so I'm sorry about that, but I'm really curious to know with the COP27 going on, I'm gonna remove this mask. Uh, so um, do you have any indigenous representation there? Um, and in case you do, what are some of the points that they plan to present to the council? No, that's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, hopefully this one uh, won't be too hard to follow, but um, I've been reading this book called The Myth of Normal by Gabor Mate, which you, uh, who you referenced, um, and in this book he talks about um, uh, the profit motive um, and lack of empathy, emotional troubles, and money as a proxy for love, um, resulting from childhood trauma wherein one doesn't get enough love or has inconsistent love from one's parents, um, which can result uh, from just the basic kind of parenting that we do in Western culture, such as letting a child cry itself to sleep. Um, this profit motive, um, as I understand it, leads to a wrong relationship with the land and humans being inseparable from that land um, leads to wrong relationship between ourselves as well. So I'm wondering if um, repairing childhood and adulthood emotional traumas, um, and you kind of spoke to this, Spencer, about uh, opening up to uncertainty and being vulnerable, um, could be a way of healing uh, our wrong relationship with the land. Um, and also, yeah, I'll just I'll stop there. That was a big, the big chain. Do you want to answer? Do you want me to start? You can start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I asked Letitia, do you want to kill this answer or let me make a fool of myself? She said, you go ahead. <laughs> um, Gee, I, uh, yeah, I, I think, I mean, the core theme of what I'm hearing in that question is like this lack of relationship and this lack of empathy, which, I mean, I don't study Gavor Mate, but it sounds like w what in this theory that if, if, if we don't have that anchor in our childhood, we make that mistake later, I think if, make that mistake of not having relationship and empathy towards non-human things later. And so my suspicion is that we can heal from that if we know that that's the case. And, and so hopefully if we identify that as a society where we think it's okay to uh, 
not have empathy for non-human beings in the way that I think we should, based on my own cultural values. I think if we can recognize that, we can move forward. I don't know if this generation will be able to save the day, but maybe it can shed a light on the next generation after us. And so some of these steps are baby steps, I think. Um, I hope that's a satisfying response. Good enough. Do you have anything to add, Leticia? I mean, I guess I could just comment on the difference in our lens and worldview in how we are raised as Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Um, I mean, I talked about how I was raised traditionally on the land for months at a time, seasonally, um, camping, you know, as, as my people had done for generations before. And I think that that was instilled within me as, as in Nivialuk. And I think that is um, common with other Indigenous peoples who have that connection and appreciation for where they come from is that lens and worldview um, in which, like, you know, respect is ingrained in us as, as we're being raised. Um, and, and speaking to the trauma piece, um, how I think some families have been severed from their, um, you know, children separated from families, like trauma there, I think that um, it, reconnecting to who we are as a people, I think there's healing in that. Um, and not to say that, you know, those, those that have lived with trauma are living in capitalistic ways, but I, I think that that's the main difference between um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous is having that um, perspective in, in how we live in relationship with, with, our, with our people, with our community, with, with the environment. I had another thought while you're, if I may. Um, the funny thing is how I see Western society and the way it deals with this funky relationship is that the understanding of empathy and, re and, and relationship and respect has turned into let's separate ourselves entirely from the ecosystem as opposed to like it's, it's common for a non-Indigenous person in, in North America say I would say more common to be uncomfortable with having to kill something to eat, like having to actually do that act. And I think that's under this disguise of like, oh, it's, it's, it's not respectful. It's like the dirty side of being human. When reality, in reality, it comes from being disconnected from an ecosystem, not understanding your place in it, And then putting up this facade of like, my discomfort is, is being disguised by respect, being disguised by me being super empathetic. That was another thought. Thank you. <laughs> we, we're going to have, someone's been waiting patiently to bring up the rear and last question. So, go ahead. okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be very quick. Um, I'm, I was very uh, touched by both presentations and I thank you uh, deeply. I'm bouncing on your last comment, Spencer, which is interesting. I'm neither North American nor um, indigenous, uh, European, so maybe coming from a tangential uh, perspective. Um, I relate completely to all the um, things that I've heard from, from both of you. And um, I wanted to ask a question about uh, that pertains to my work. I'm a PhD student in, in Victoria and I'm studying uh, from the modeling perspective the impact of climate change on ecosystems, specifically in the Inuvialuit area, uh, and I'm working in Ulukaktok. Um, and uh, I struggle a little bit uh, with a lot of interest in uh, bringing together, uh, I mean, being of interest, of, uh, in being useful for the community. Uh, in, in bringing together some of my knowledge, which is math and things like that, and bringing that with, with the knowledge that you were speaking of. Uh, and 
one of the things that I try to do, I really hear like, you know, listen to the land and, and the land will tell you how to live respectfully, sustainably. Um, you know, I'm not from there, so all I can do is listen to the people that are from there, right? So that's one of the things that I'm trying to do, but I'm curious if you have advice for me or for others that are scientists, so beyond go and garden and connect to your land, uh, which is, I think, you know, really, really useful. But beyond that, uh, any advice in, um, you know, acknowledging the responsibility of scientists that go on indigenous lands and work with indigenous communities, what can we do um, that could be of use and how can we, um, yeah, um, serve in that connection between two paradigms, essentially? Yeah. Simple question. <laughs> Over to you guys. Um, so Uluhaktuk is actually a community in the Inuvial Settlement region where I come from. It's one of the six communities in the ISR. Um, I would just have to say that, like, be humble. Um, just try to understand that Western science is not superior to traditional knowledge. It's just as valid, it's just as valuable as Western science. Um, only now are we, you know, tapping into those knowledges in order to, to save, you know, the environment, save the world, save people, whatever. Like, it's only now that we're paying attention to those knowledges. Um, yeah, like, just be humble, as I said, and, and like, be open to maybe um, hearing stories that might make you uncomfortable because where I come from, it's, um, it's very remote. It's, you know, these are communities that have very little outside influence, and so their ways of life are starkly different than southern communities. Um, yeah, just have an open mind and um, just try to learn as much as you can and... and yeah, be respectful, I guess, is <laughs> the best that I can answer. Thank you. Spence, do you want to add to that? Yeah. I don't know if you could tell, but I'm also European. I, I have European ancestry. And uh, uh, so a part of me feels like I was born to straddle both of these knowledge systems. Maybe that's like some Catholic guilt showing up or something. I don't know. <laughs> Family's not Catholic either. I, um, I think humility is a huge part. Knowing that we didn't need science, Western science, because we had science. Um, people use the term indigenous science. It's just science. Um, there's different cultural takes on science. Uh, uh, and so knowing that, that we didn't need it for so long, that that's going to be, when you go into a community, like accept that sort of energy and, and uh, perception of science. But know that indigenous communities, as Letitia has said, recognize what an important tool it's become now in the colonial context, in the context of environmental change. And so there's just this complexity to it. I, uh, I, was, I was reading Jody Wilson-Raybould's book, Indian in the Cabinet, and she, she s spoke about something that just made so much of our engagement, indigenous engagement with the Western world so clear. She talked about politics being this act of teams against each other, or these teams against each other. And it was so foreign when she first joined the, the liberals and, and this sort of dynamic of like, this is our political party, we gotta beat that other team, and that's the priority we have today. But where she was brought up in indigenous politics, there was tension, there was conflict, but the end game was to find a resolution together as opposed to beat the other team. And I think academia has that same sort of poison 
We're like, we're taught to debate to crush the opponent. When it, it just doesn't reflect what we do in indigenous worlds because we're anchored in these relationships of we want to maintain our relationship with this place and our neighbors in this way. And so if you use that perspective when you come with science, I think it can open up the doors, it can op open up these relationships in a really beautiful way that can help guide us into the future in the context of what we're facing now. That's a very nice way to end. We thank you both very much from the bottom of our hearts. Please join me. Oh